Radio.com. I'm Liz Niesloss. Tonight on Greater Boston, Massachusetts has a new governor. We'll look back on an historic inauguration day for the state and ahead, what to expect from Maura Healy in the first hundred days. Then later, the life and legacy of Pope Benedict XVI and what it means for the future of the Catholic Church. It's now official. Maura Healey is the governor of Massachusetts. In a history-making moment this morning, the former attorney general took the oath of office and then delivered her inaugural address. I share this office as the first woman and first paid person ever elected governor of Massachusetts. In this state, we're all trailblazers. We're all leaders. That's why we live in Massachusetts. No matter the challenges we face ahead, we will stay true to the best of ourselves. We will act with empathy and equity, and we will work together. But once all of the pomp and circumstance dies down, Healy will have to hit the ground running on a series of problems plaguing the state. From the ever-embattled MBTA and an affordable housing crisis to a fast-spreading new variant of COVID. So what can we expect to see from Governor Healy in the next few days, weeks, and months? I'm joined now by Erin O'Brien, an associate professor of political science at UMass Boston, and GBH News political editor, Peter Katsis, welcome to you both. Uh, Aaron, let's start with you. Does uh, Maura Healy, she's a known commodity, she, does she get a honeymoon period as some incoming politicians do? My theory on this is that uh, most politicians get 100 days if you're a person of color, if you're a woman, you get maybe 50 to 33 days. So yes, <laughs> I think there's a honeymoon, but maybe not quite as long as some of the guys have enjoyed. Okay, Peter, you have a similar recipe? Um, I'm not so sure how long the honeymoon will be. I think she'll have one. The reason I say that is getting the Massachusetts legislature to do anything, even in 100 days, is pretty tough. Okay, well, she has what some people call the trifecta, right? The Senate, the House, the governor, all of the same party. What do you think that's going to mean? Um, it should mean going in smoother sailing than you might expect. Um, listen, the, 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 the most promising bit of political intelligence I heard recently was that a few days before her inauguration, she was seen at the UMass Club having lunch with former Speaker Bob DeLeo. Um, she was clearly being primed for how to deal with the legislature. See, the governor is at her best when there's a crisis. Um, when it comes to making long-term policy, um, she needs the assent of the legislature, and they can be a prickly bunch. Her inaugural address, however, was terrific. She laid out some very clear and specific goals, especially towards housing. And if she could get the new sec uh, the, the secretaryship for housing established in the first 100 days, I'd say she'd be off to a very good start. Okay, well, you're a bit ahead of me, Peter, but since you mentioned it, <laughs> let's hear what she had to say on housing in her inaugural address. We'll use property that belongs to the people to help the people. I've already directed my Secretary of Administration and Finance to identify unused state-owned land that can be turned into rental housing or homes within one year. We'll get first-time home buyers the help that they need. Reduce the cost of Okay, Erin, is she proposing something radical here? We've seen a little bit of this already from Mayor Wu. Not at all radical. I mean, that's music to Massachusetts residents' ears, regardless of your partisanship and who you voted for. We have a housing crisis. Uh, she talked about an affordability crisis. She talked about a childcare crisis. Those are all indeed huge problems in Massachusetts. Her naming them and having specific ideas and specific centers in which her administration will deal with them is specific and it is necessary. Peter, you see anything she should be doing on housing, any particular power she should be taking? I th I would stand behind her uh, move to have a special cabinet secretary 
named. Um, that would cover a lot of ground rather than dissipating her energies and trying to do a little bit here and a little bit there. I actually think it's a, a quite novel idea. She talked about people leaving Massachusetts in droves. She said they are exiting the state more than any other state in the union. Do you think housing is a big part of that? Oh, sure. The cost of living is part of it. And housing is, you know, unless you're a gazillionaire, housing is your single largest cost. Uh, it's a very, very serious problem. P we think of Massachusetts as being this, uh, this golden state that attracts people from all over. People can't afford to stay here. Erin, do you see other places she could shore up that exodus? Anything else she should be focused on? I mean, she talked about child care. And, you know, like Peter said, she talked about Massachusetts as the greatest nation or the greatest state in the nation. She talked about this idea of Massachusetts exceptionalism, that we do it better here. We have the first public library. We were first in gay marriage, first in public school. Our constitution is the model. And then she said, hey, if we're so special, we need to fix those things. So, but and I thought that was a very uh, a poetic use of Massachusetts exceptionalism to cajole us into better housing, cajole us into affordable child care. So if child care is such a major factor, what power does she have? One of the big issues is salaries aren't high enough. What can she do about something like that? Well, she talked about this common street bill that would essentially scale how much you're paying in child care uh, to your income, as I understand it, it would be no more than 7% of your um, it income that you take home. So you're right, she's going to need partners in the private sector, wages, you know, minimum wage just went up. So it's not, uh, I think her naming it is in part the difference of a female governor. And she did have a specific underneath there with that common street bill. Is it everything? No, but it's day one in a speech. I think uh, a lot of us will give her a little time to fix that one. Well, another place she has really put herself out in front is on climate. She uh, says she will be the most climate active governor in uh, the country. Uh, here's what she had to say in her inaugural on climate. Tomorrow, I'm issuing my first executive order. It will create the country's first cabinet-level climate chief, reporting directly to me. For the first time ever in our state's history, I'll propose we commit at least 1% of the state budget to environmental and energy agencies. A state investment in the budget of the clean energy sector. Let's commit to making climate innovation the next big investment. Peter, where do you think she has to put her energies on climate? <laughs> well, it depends on how you define climate. Climate means energy. And um, what will her stance be on natural gas? There's a strong lobby in the state that wants all fossil fuels abolished. As a matter of fact, I'm pretty sure they're scheduled to be picketing her inaugural gala tonight. Um, I, I think... Safe ground, of course, is, you know, wind and solar, renewables. But again, that's how you define climate, and that intersects and or collides with fossil fuels. So that's a naughty problem. Yeah, and you pick up on a point uh, which she will have to deal with. It's a kind of issue that requires working with both public and private sector, bringing in business. Um, but there will be a lot of pressure from more progressive organizations. Do you think that this will be a moment uh, now that she has sort of moved on from being under Baker's shadow, that she will be pushed further to the left by things like climate and other causes, Erin? I think she wants to go to the left on climate. Um, that, that's in keeping with who she is. Uh, you know, I'm near the Weymouth compressor station. She could come in there and try to work to shut that down, um, be proactive in that way. And young voters uh, want her to deliver on the environment. But in other realms, I don't think she'll be pushed to the left because she beat um, Sonia Chang Diaz, a more progressive, um, talented politician. She beat her handily. So, you know, it's sort of once you win, you win big in the primary and you win big in the primary election without the full backing of total progressives. Then Maura Haley has shown she doesn't need them, but she wants them on things like the environment. And I think to work together well on that issue, but maybe not so good on some others. 
Uh, Peter, uh, how do you think she will be different from Baker? How do you see her distinguishing herself? During the campaign, a lot was made of the fact that she was somewhat, as our colleague uh, Adam Riley said, somewhat Baker-esque. Uh, how do you think she's going to distinguish herself now? Well, by Baker-esque, I can't speak for Adam, but I can interpret him. Um, <laughs> I, 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 I think what Adam was saying is that she maintains a calm demeanor, that she's not, in television terms, a hot personality. And that came through in her inaugural. She was very persuasive, uh, at times being very personal, preacher-teacher. That's the sim similarity with Baker. Um, she's more forthcoming when she's forthcoming, which isn't always. She's more forthcoming with Baker. But she naturally tilts to the, she does tilt left. It remains to be seen how left she is. Baker tilts right. Um, Baker was a great compromiser. And in a way, Baker had an advantage being a Republican with the legislature because his approval ratings were so high, the legislature would have to think twice before they took him on. And they took him on a lot of times, but they did it quietly and subtly and allowed him to save face. The whole key to her governorship is going to be her relationship with the legislature, especially the House of Representatives. And her relationships in Washington, how will that be different from Baker? I'm not sure it'll be that different. I mean, the whole congregation in, in uh, a delegation, <laughs> rather, in, in Washington. Yeah, we also have Pope Funeral on the train, I think. Is dedicated to trying to bring home the bacon for Massachusetts. They haven't been doing a very good job lately, though. I mean, as uh, the, the funding about rebuilding the Cape Cod bridges is now in deep, deep question. Aaron, are you in agreement on that? She won't have much more luck in Washington? Well, yeah, I mean, she has willing partners in the Massachusetts delegation. You know, Baker and Marty Walsh had a, a, a good relationship. But, you know, Massachusetts punches above, uh, above its weight in D.C., and I think they'll continue to. Um, listen, the Massachusetts delegation has every reason in the world um, to work well with her. Indeed, she's a fellow Democrat. So uh, I think they'll take her into the fold uh, quite quickly. And we can't they share interest. <laughs> right. We can't leave the issue of the tea and transit on the table. Where do you think she will be different from Baker? Well, it's going to depend on the team she puts in place to administer the tea. Um, listen, she and Baker will say, would say the same things on the surface. It's the people you appoint. Um, it's the people you appoint. And can she get the legislature to make a bigger investment in the tea, which is what's needed. But the, the, the short term will depend on who her, you know, Mr. or Ms. T turns out to be. Right. Aaron, do you think she will have better luck with the legislature when it comes to consistent funding for the tea? Yeah, in the sense that, listen, everybody wants to fix the tea. It's an albatross. Um, but, you know, it always mystified me a little bit that Charlie Baker, as the technocrat governor, never paid for the tea. All of us agree the tea is pretty abysmal. He agreed the tea is pretty abysmal. But he never paid in terms of popular support. I'll be interested to see if she doesn't show immediate returns on the tea. Do her numbers start to chip away? Because now Massachusetts expects if you have an entirely Democratic leadership team and the state house and state Senate, then you know a lot of novices say it should be easier to get work done. Um, but I actually think Baker enjoyed uh, being the foil of the legislature and the legislature enjoyed it back because it made they each had someone to blame when things didn't get done. Peter? Look, I'll be able to report back on this in a couple of months. I take the orange line. We'll see if my trips <laughs> speed up at all. All right. Well, we are we almost have to wrap, but I got to ask you about COVID. She's coming in just as a COVID uh, rise is currently happening. That could not only kill a honeymoon, but kill a lot of plans. Any thoughts? Um, COVID is under control in this state. Um, there, there may be a, a, a spike in, you know, people shaking their hands, but um, it, it's under control. You know, it's a public health issue. I don't see any big challenge there as long as she's up front and out front about it.
Okay, we're going to have to leave it there. Aaron O'Brien, thank you very much. And Peter Katzis, thank you. thank you. Take care. Next up, Pope Emeritus Benedict XVI was laid to rest in the Vatican today after his death Saturday at age 95. His successor, Pope Francis, presided over the funeral, one of the very few times in history that one pope has done so for another. That's because after leading the Catholic Church for eight years, Benedict resigned in 2013, the first pope to give up power in six centuries. His death closes the book on a complicated chapter within the Catholic Church, as Benedict's tenure was punctuated by accusations that he mishandled allegations of sexual abuse by members of the clergy. So what kind of legacy does the late Pope leave behind? And what's next for the future of the Catholic Church? I'm joined by Thomas Groom, a professor of theology and religious education at Boston College, who is also the author of What Makes Education Catholic? Spiritual Foundations. And Margaret Roylance, Vice President of Voice of the Faithful, a lay Catholic group that supports survivors of clergy sex abuse and promotes change within the church. Thank you both for joining me. Let's start, um, if you would, Thomas, with the funeral itself. I think people are fascinated by the tradition and by the ritual around a papal funeral. Can you explain just very basically one of the details? The Pope is buried in three coffins. This is a coffin inside a coffin inside a coffin. Is there anything you can, can tell us about why that is or the, I, the meaning of why he Liz, is buried with certain elements? <laughs> Liz, you just taught me something. I didn't know oh, he was buried okay. in, three, in three coffins, <laughs> but he certainly will have enough coffins. I suppose it's, it's for security. And I think this event captures the imagination of the world because it's, it's almost 2,000 years and th that this goes back. Now, I don't think St. Peter had that elaborate a, 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 an inauguration, but very soon in the early centuries of the church, the, the church began to take on these powerful trappings. And in some ways, it was, a, it was a reflection of the Roman Empire, and the emperor was at the top, and then all the legates down around him, etc. Uh, but so the, the papacy, I suppose it, 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 uh, it, it, it engages people's imagination. There's very little going on in our world that goes back a couple of thousand years, uh, or they can be traced, uh, 1,500 years at least, shall we say. Uh, so in that sense, it's fascinating. Uh, the three coffins are probably, as I said, just a security, because there was probably at times in the history of the church when people would come and try to take the body as as uh, relics or something, and, you know, uh, so I'm not sure why they did, why the three okay. coffins. Like, like I've okay. never heard of it before. Okay, well, we can leave he's it. Certainly, he's certainly well buried. <laughs> I, was, I would think so. Um, and and uh, Thomas, what do you think the legacy will be of Pope Benedict for the church? Yeah, well, like all of us, Liz, he, he left, you know, he left a, a mixed legacy, really. I mean, there are ways in which I, your introduction was mentioning the sex abuse scandal, and there's ways in which, uh, there are ways in which he did better than Pope John Paul II did. On the other hand, there, there, there are ways in which he didn't live up to our expectations either. And uh, so, but it was a growing consciousness for the church throughout its history, or throughout that time and that era, that this was not just a sin, but this a horrible crime and destructive of children, etc., or of, of, of victims or whatever age. Um, so there was the church was sadly slow to realize and recognize that and to act accordingly. And but he did, I think, in fairness to him, he did take us a step beyond where Pope uh, John Paul II had it. John Paul basically left it in the hands of the local bishops, and the local bishops basically were negligent. Very often, the, the people accused of the crime right. were buddies of but the bishop. You know, there, was, there were priests in the same diocese together. So a lot, there was nothing, a lot of dioceses were doing nothing about it. And Benedict took it out of the hands of the local bishops into the hands of the Congregation for the Doctrine of the Faith. In other words, took the whole thing to the Vatican. And after that, there was a lot more priests suspended and expelled, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera. So in a sense, he was somewhat of a catalyst well, toward a Right. The issue. Uh, so let's bring in Margaret on that. Certainly you have a, you have a take on this. Um, how do you view his legacies from, through the lens of the sexual abuse? 
Well, as everybody has said, Tom uh, uh, included, he was a complex man and uh, he did many things well. His uh, he was a theologian, and a lot of his ideas informed the the concepts of Vatican II. So he was always saw people had accused him of being uh, he he was all about continuity. But no, he as well as every pope since John the twenty third has uh, recognized that there needed to be reform in in the church. But as I. Uh, as I uh, have said before, he was a real creature of the church of the 20th century. And, and, and he had all the blind spots that go with that, including uh, protecting the church at all costs, um, a, a real aversion to transparency. Uh, and he was, uh, I, I believe but his main strength was that he could see he really recognized the 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 harm and and the the tragedy of the sexual abuse crisis and and did something about it he was the one that got rid of uh um Marcel Marcel uh the and, and a lot of others so he cleaned up a lot of the mess that he got he inherited from John uh Right. And Margaret, you seem to suggest that the uh, abuse, the problem, the scale of it, that that was the cause of his resignation. No, no, I, I don't think that was, I mean, certainly that was part of it. He resigned, I think, as an act of real courage because he looked at the problems and said, I cannot solve them. Uh, it's beyond me. It's a problem bigger than I am. And so he had the courage to resign. Uh, and once he was no longer Bishop of Rome, he was no longer the Pope. Um, and he, uh, to a large extent, stepped back and let Francis try to carry on with uh, reform. And I believe that as far as uh, abuse is concerned, I think Francis has uh, done many good things. Uh, on the point of the resignation, though, Thomas, do you see that as really part of why he stepped down? I think so. I think I, I would agree with Margaret that, that I think he was tired and he recognized that he didn't have the energy, the courage, whatever it was he was, he, he was lacking. He was tired. And I, I think he was very, it was, it, in some ways, it'll be his great lasting legacy. Now, that's not to minimize any other, the other good things he did. But 500 years from now, when they talk about Benedict, the one thing they'll say about him is that he resigned. And in a sense, he helped to demystify the role of the papacy. Like Catholic we think of the of the papacy of the Pope as kind of, almost like a divine being that that ontologically is different from the rest of us, and in a sense, Benedict simply said, "No, it, it's a, it's a it's a function of service. It's a ministry to the church, and it's a role of service." And and he was tired and and weary of serving for eight years, and so he happily resigned. And I think and I think he really did resign. There was a lot of fear at the time: Would he really? Uh, would we end up with two popes in conflict? because he was distinctly more right of center than John Paul, uh, than Pope Francis. And so there was a lot of apprehension, you know, would, would the kind of more traditionalist Catholics still have a hero in Benedict and uh, the reformist people would be more attached to, to Pope Francis. But that did not transpire, really, in fairness to him. He kept quiet and kept right. to himself, said his prayers, and got himself ready to go home to God. But, he, but uh, with his passing, we again seem to be hearing a lot of talk about how the church is at a crossroads, how uh, Benedict was very much and is sort of an avatar for conservatism, um, and Francis instilled with the more progressive qualities. Thomas, do you think these distinctions are valid? Well, I think some of the distinctions are valid, and some of the things, some of the ways in which he was a traditionalist didn't bother me too much. The fact that he allowed some people to go back to celebrating the Mass in Latin, uh, I thought that was a little bit crazy, but a lot of people seemed to want it, or at least a, a very small minority of people. So I wasn't too troubled by that at all, and not my friends who were, and who thought it was awful that he did that, etc. But I thought that'll die out. But but some of the things that he, uh, the traditionalist positions he took that were destructive, for example, 
people towards our gay, our LGBTQ brothers and sisters. He was very insensitive and basically reiterated and used language and allowed the church to use language like it being dis intrinsically disordered and a grave depravity. A very different than Pope Francis. Pope Francis said, we've got to listen and learn. We've got to listen to and learn from our LGBTQ brothers and sisters. And we, the whole, the church is in a transition on, in this regard. Uh, and it has to be because in many ways, our position on, on the whole issue of sexual, sexual orientation is, is false. It's based on false science, false biology, false sociology, false psychology. So we're all learning to stand back and say, just condemning gay people that way is, is, is totally false. And we can't do that. And as Francis says, we've got to listen, listen and learn. And uh, we've to face into a new moment because, you know, the church approved of slavery for 1900 years. So that the fact that they have opposed uh, LGBTQ people and, and gay lifestyle is not surprising, but it should not be our future. Do you, and and uh, Benedict did nothing to move us ahead. In fact, he reiterated the, tradi the, the traditionalist position. Uh, so, Margaret, how do you see this, this idea of a crossroads? Do you see the passing of Benedict as removing some sort of break on those uh, critics of uh, Pope Francis, that, that, that the divisions will rise? Well, I no, I, I don't think so. I, I think that Pope Francis has a view of the church that really uh, is, uh, I think, characterized by the the conclusion at this point so far of the synod, which is uh, broaden your tent, uh, listen, uh, and and I think that the. Uh, He's very much moving forward in, with a with a new paradigm of the church that involves mutual discernment, uh, including the the clergy and and the people of God. Well, they include they're included in the people of God, <laughs> but um, I think I think that um, uh, Benedict uh, couldn't see that was not comfortable with that. Just and and a lot of the how shall I say this the uh, the plutocrats uh, the rich uh, American Catholics that are funding the bishops that are uh, uh, opposing Francis have been you know referring to Benedict improperly to some extent and and I think that they're going to lose some steam because of this. Okay, well, unfortunately, we're going to have to leave it there. Thomas Groom, Margaret Roylance, thank you very much. Thank you, Liz. Been a pleasure. Thank you. That's it for tonight, but come back tomorrow for Talking Politics. From Charlie Baker's lone walk out of the State House to Healy's historic inauguration. And her first steps in office, Adam Riley and his panel will unpack the eventful week on Beacon Hill. Plus, Healy's promise to open up her office to public records requests and push state lawmakers and the courts to do the same. That and more tomorrow at 7. Thanks for watching. Good night. Your day.